Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today at the Engage Social Isolation Virtual Summit. I'm Sandy Markwood, the CEO of the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging. N4A has the privilege of administering Engaged, the National Resource Center for Engaging Older Adults, which is funded by the U.S. Administration for Community Living as a national effort to increase the social engagement among older adults. We do this by identifying and disseminating social engagement resources, best practices, and replication strategies for the aging network. Now that I've introduced myself, I'd like to encourage you to introduce yourselves too. On the right side of your screen, you'll see a Q&A and Ideas tab on the conference platform. Please use the Ideas tab as a way to chat and engage with over 2,500 colleagues that are joining you on today's summit. Feel free to introduce yourselves there as well. There is also a Q&A box. During the moderated panels, you can type in questions. We're hosting this virtual summit today because we know the negative impact that social isolation can have on older adults. And we know that social engagement programming helps mitigate those effects. Social engagement has long been a critical area of focus for the Aging Network, and the COVID-19 pandemic has only increased the importance of and the need for social engagement programming. As a result of the pandemic, the Aging Network quickly adapted and revamped existing programming and launched new programming to help older adults remain engaged safely at home. And as the COVID-19 pandemic continues, the Aging Network remains committed to reducing social isolation through creative approaches. And that's why we're here today, to learn from and to dialogue with national experts and local leaders around the latest social isolation research and COVID-19 adaptations to address social isolation. We'll also be discussing the role of technology to foster social engagement. We'll have a mixture of PowerPoint slides and interactive discussions today. And I hope you're as excited as I am to hear the discussion and also to participate in it. Before we go further, I also want to acknowledge the Engaged National Resource Center's longstanding partners that have joined us in this work from our first grant, which started three years ago. They are Generations United the National Resource Center for OSHA Lifelong Learning Institutes, and Older Adults Technology Services, OATS. We were recently honored to receive a second round of funding from ACL, which will allow us to continue this work and also expand our partnerships. I'm excited to be joined today by so many amazing, innovative leaders in this space, but in particular, I'm thrilled to be joined by Greg Lynn. Greg Link is the Director of the Office of Supportive and Caregiver Services within the Administration for Community Living. His office oversees programs funded under the Older Americans Act, including Title III-B, In-Home Supportive Services, Title III-E, the National Family Caregiver Support Program, as well as ACL's Alzheimer's Disease Programs. Greg and his team also provide general oversight and technical assistance to the aging network on a range of program areas. Greg's office oversees the cooperative agreement that funds the work of the Engaged National Resource Center. Greg, thank you so much for being with us today and for helping us to kick off the virtual summit. Greg? Thank you, Sandy. Uh, it is great to be here with you to be able to kick off the summit together. I want to thank everyone for joining us today as we focus attention on the significant topic of engaging older adults to combat social isolation and loneliness, particularly during the COVID pandemic. It is my pleasure to bring greetings from the Administration for Community Living, the Administration on Aging. Uh, we are so thrilled to see the number of people who have registered to join the session today. Indeed, over 2,500 of you have tuned in today to listen to what our presenters have to say. Uh, it just reaffirms how important this issue is to the aging network, to older caregivers, to older adults, and to family caregivers. First, I want to acknowledge the commitment so many um, have made to continue serving our communities during these unprecedented times. 
At ACL, we have been overwhelmed, but certainly not surprised to see how programs have adapted and responded to the COVID-19 pandemic. Combating social isolation requires a really thoughtful strategy to connect people. The Aging Network is well positioned to foster meaningful social interactions that help decrease social isolation because our folks are trusted and a known connection. The Aging Network and other programs serving older adults have stepped up during this crisis to find new and innovative ways to serve and keep older adults engaged. As you'll hear shortly from Dr. Holt Lundstad, research is documenting the toll of social isolation and loneliness on health. We are seeing that remaining socially engaged can help improve the quality of life for older adults and is associated with better health. At ACL, we are very interested in expanding the reach of the Aging Services Network to more effectively assist older adults to remain socially engaged and active. For decades, ACL has funded programs to address social isolation. In the time of COVID, we have seen our networks masterfully pivot to deliver programs in new ways with new partners. You'll see many of those efforts highlighted today. Earlier this year, as Sandy mentioned, or we, um, ACL announced the $750,000 prize challenge that will help foster the development of online tools that will connect socially isolated individuals with available resources. In 2017, ACL specifically targeted social engagement by funding N4A to support the Engaged National Resource Center to highlight and encourage efforts to help older adults stay engaged. Given the importance of this issue, ACL was delighted, as Sandy had mentioned just a moment ago, to continue to support this work by awarding a new three-year grant to N4A. Looking ahead, uh, ACL is committed to continuing to explore and invest in new innovations and programs that assist older adults to remain socially engaged and that support the foundation of independence. I want to thank N4A for allowing me to say hello to you all and to provide greetings. It is important that the Aging Network remain connected and coordinated in order to build upon the work already done in this space to add value and build knowledge. That's why convenings such as this are critical. Thank you so much, and I look forward to today's event. Um, Sandy? Great. Thank you, Greg, for joining us today and for sharing your remarks and, and all your support. We're so appreciative of ACL's leadership in the social isolation and social engagement space and for the ongoing your support that this work is making such a difference in the aging network. As we kick off the virtual summit today, I wanted to highlight a brand new video from the Engaged National Resource Center, which highlights the importance of social engagement for older adults and spotlights several best practices initiatives. Now more than ever before, we know how important it is to connect with each other, whether it's virtually or in person. Research tells us that older adults who remain socially engaged experience greater physical, mental, and emotional health and well being. And older adults who are socially engaged also have a positive and a powerful impact on their communities. Because we know that social isolation and loneliness are growing health concerns for the nation's older adults, N4A administers the Engaged National Resource Center. Our mission at Engaged is to support the Aging Network in efforts to increase social engagement among older adults and caregivers. Social engagement needs to be a program that we provide every day within our package of services. It's just as important as home health care, it's just as important as transportation and as a meal. And the need for social engagement programming only increased with the COVID-19 pandemic. Aging Network organizations quickly adapted their social engagement programming to respond to the new reality and to mitigate the impact of social isolation on older adults. Meals in congregate or group settings bring older adults together and offer opportunities for social engagement and connection while providing critical nutrition. We see people driving up. We're able to give them other supplies. We've done masks, toilet paper, paper towels, sanitizer, activity books, coloring, drawing markers, pencils. 
The Cowlitz Indian Tribe Title VI program also adapted programming to better address nutrition and social engagement needs during the COVID-19 pandemic. They enjoy those sort of activities and it keeps their brains and their minds busy and their hands. For many people, pets are part of their families and provide important emotional support and engagement. However, affording pet food can be difficult for people with lower fixed incomes. Knowing that they're finding comfort in their pets and that we can do something for them and their pets to keep them in their home safely is just a gift. It's helped a lot because when you're on a fixed income, sometimes you do without your food to help the pets. But I love my little animal. This dog has been my, my life since I went legally blind. As programs moved into the home, aging network organizations began tapping into technology platforms like Zoom or Facebook Live to offer interactive classes. Having in, in the virtual um, in the virtual media, it has been amazing. And you can see that they still have this engagement and they still feel this joy to, you know, join the class. We've invited some of our repair experts to do Zoom uh, presentations on lamp repair, which is always the, the biggest item and the longest line at Repair Cafe, um, and bike repairs, because people are out and biking more and more. One of the great things about this is it's given our seniors a way to show their skills, their talent, their ability to organize. We put out surveys and we learned that people wanted to be interactive. They wanted a reason to get up in the morning. And so fitness classes were definitely one of the most popular. And then they started adding more lecture classes, um, meditation, journaling. Uh, our staff got very creative. Having to stay inside or um, limiting your contact with other people can create a depressing mood for people. So knowing that they have their activities and classes coming up, it's a reason to get up, it's a reason to take a shower and get dressed, it's something to look forward to in the day, and that can make a huge difference. Social engagement programming is more essential than ever. The aging networks work to safely combat social isolation and loneliness through new and innovative social engagement approaches and programming will continue during the pandemic and beyond. Great. Whereas the video highlighted best practices from the field, we really wanted to start off our discussion today to talk about the research behind social isolation. We are so pleased to be joined today by Dr. Julianne holt Lundstad as a professor of psychology and neuroscience at Brigham Young University. Her research is focused on the long-term health effects of social connection. Her work has been seminal in the recognition of social isolation and loneliness as risk factors for early mortality. As Dr. Holt Lundstad has provided expert testimony in a U.S. congressional hearing, provided expert recommendations for the U.S. Surgeon General Emotional Well-Being in America initiative, and also served on the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicines Committee on the Health and medical dimensions of social isolation and loneliness in older adults. Her work has been highlighted in numerous major media outlets. Today, Dr. Holt Lundstadt will be sharing the latest research on social isolation and loneliness, setting the stage for the rest of the summit. Julianne? 
Thank you, Sandy. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful to be here with you all, albeit virtually. Um, but I'm, I'm grateful to speak about the important topic of social isolation and loneliness among older adults and, and give a brief overview of what we currently know. Uh, as, as most of us are aware, roughly six months ago, on March 11th, 2020, the World Health Organization declared a worldwide pandemic, marking the beginning of closures and other restrictions across the country and the world. And suddenly, the entire population was homebound, giving us all a small glimpse into the experiences of approximately 6% of older adults, or 2 million, who were already homebound. However, of course, social isolation and loneliness were already growing public health concerns internationally, um, as well as, as here locally, um, even prior to the pandemic. So for instance, in 2018, the UK appointed a minister for loneliness. And in February of this year, the National Academy of Sciences um, issued a report on the medical and healthcare relevance of social isolation and loneliness among older adults. So I'd like to first start by just simply um, clarifying and distinguishing between some related terms, uh, being homebound, social isolation, and loneliness. Social isolation is objectively being, or sorry, homebound, I should start with, um, is never or rarely leaving the home over the past month. Social isolation is objectively being alone, having few relationships or infrequent social contact. And loneliness is subjectively feeling alone, the discrepancy between one's desired level of connection and one's actual level of connection. So of course these things can co-occur, but not necessarily. And conversely, uh, social connection is an umbrella term that encompasses the structure, functions, and quality of relationships, all of which may contribute to health and well-being. So even prior to the, the COVID-19 pandemic, there was evidence that a significant portion of the population was already isolated, lonely, or both. And while several national uh, surveys have documented these prevalence rates, uh, according to a 2018 AARP study, one in three older adults is profoundly lonely, and others suggest it may be higher. For example, Cigna's National Survey reported prevalence rates of 46% in 2018 and then 61% in 2019, suggesting that loneliness prevalence rates were rising even before the pandemic. Surveys, uh, um, whether in the US or the BBC survey that's international, suggest that loneliness can occur across age, income levels, living situations, and gender. However, rates are highest among those at younger ages, with lower incomes, and those with chronic health conditions um, and those living alone. While there are several indicators of social isolation, that objective indicator, uh, one routinely collected in the US Census is living alone, which has been shown to steadily increase over time and, and certainly may be relevant in light of the pandemic and among high risk populations. So how about since the pandemic? Uh, uh, at, you know, since this time and the necessary stay at home and social distancing recommendations, of course, researchers are um, frantically uh, trying to determine if loneliness is increasing and if so, among what groups. And so, um, uh, some surveys suggest that 20 to 30% of adults surveyed report that they are feeling lonelier now than uh, pre-COVID, while another recent study out of Florida State found minimal changes in response to COVID-19, suggesting some degree of resilience. However, in both cases, the samples were not uh, specific to older adults. Um, very recent data, um, from the national poll on, on healthy aging out just this month suggests that changes in both loneliness and social contacts between 2018 and 2020, uh, such that there were increases in the percentages of older adults that lacked companionship, 
felt isolated from others and had infrequent social contact. Of course, researchers, including myself, are still collecting data and um, trying to understand who's most vulnerable and, um, uh, and who are the most at-risk populations that may be severe, most severely affected. So as we're facing a deadly virus, I'm sure many are wondering, well, why should we even care about social isolation and loneliness? And it's important to recognize that this isn't just feeling miserable. Uh, social isolation and loneliness may actually be deadly. And the deadly effects of social isolation and loneliness are not limited only to suicide and domestic violence. We have robust evidence of the increased risk for death from all causes. My research, which has included data from over 3.4 uh, million uh, participants, uh, shows that um, loneliness increases risk for earlier death by 26%, social isolation by 29%, and living alone by 32%. Conversely, uh, being socially connected is protective and increases the odds of survival by 50%. And across decades of research, we now have evidence that the health risks are comparable to other leading risk factors for premature mortality. We also have robust evidence um, across a variety of, of health outcomes. Um, uh, for instance, uh, social isolation and loneliness um, have, has uh, impacts physical health outcomes, including increased risk for heart attack and stroke and type, type 2 diabetes. Um, when it comes to mental and behavioral health outcomes, uh, it, there's uh, research to demonstrate increased risk for depression and anxiety, suicidal, suicidality and addiction. Uh, when it comes to cognitive health outcomes, there's uh, research linking this to mild co cognitive impairment, dementia, and Alzheimer's. And uh, social isolation and loneliness has even been associated with um, uh, economic outcomes. For example, um, the recent AARP study found socially isolated uh, older adults um, were linked to 6.7 billion in annual Medicare spending. And the economic burden of loneliness is likely much larger, given that it has been linked to greater workplace absenteeism, low lower productivity, and lower quality of work, um, suggesting this has economic uh, impacts as well. But of course, most of these outcomes I've just mentioned are chronic. And indeed, there are also some immediate effects of social isolation and loneliness. So first, we should be clear that the distress due to social distancing that many of us are experiencing is a normal response. Humans are a social species, and throughout human history, we have relied on others for survival. So proximity to others, particularly trusted others, signals safety. And when we lack proximity to trusted others, our brain and body may respond with a heightened state of alert. And this can result in increases in blood pressure, stress hormones, and inflammatory responses, which if experienced on a chronic basis can put us at increased risk for a variety of chronic illnesses. But among those with pre-existing health conditions, these changes in physiology and behavior could potentially exacerbate the condition precipitate the onset of acute events or hasten disease progression. The distressed feeling of loneliness is thought to be our biology signaling a need to reconnect socially. Just like hunger signals us to eat and, th and thirst signals us to drink water, neuroscientists have argued that loneliness is a biological drive that motivates us to reconnect. So are we literally craving human contact right now? <laughs> uh, a recent study out of MIT found that 10 hours of isolation had a neuro, uh, similar neurosignature as 10 hours without food, suggesting that acute isolation causes social craving similar to hunger. 
The immediate effects of social isolation related to the pandemic may also extend beyond mental health concerns to influence not only our biology, but also our behavior. For example, there's some evidence to suggest that this is resulting in increases in problematic behaviors, including substance use, poor sleep, and emotional overeating. Further, uh, more than 2 million Americans purchased guns during the month of March, raising concerns for increased risk of suicide. This is particularly concerning as older white males are at increased risk for suicide. So what about susceptibility to the virus itself? Well, last month, uh, a review was published summarizing 35 years of study, studies identifying factors associated with susceptibility to cold and flu viruses. In, in this series of studies, uh, results showed that participants experiencing interpersonal stressors such as loneliness had a greater chance of developing an upper respiratory illnesses when exposed to cold viruses. This suggests that loneliness may potentially play a similar role in response to COVID-19. But both uh, short-term and long-term public health concerns may emerge if steps are not taken to mitigate these effects. So during this pandemic, the challenge is, um, the challenge to reduce risk is exponentially compounded. If loneliness is a biological cue similar to thirst, we cannot access what we crave most. It's as if we are all incredibly thirsty, but being told that the water is not safe to drink. Thus, we are faced with the challenge of how to satisfy this biological need without close proximity to others. Of course, there's currently no pill to solve this problem. And although pharmaceutical approaches are being explored in research, no one approach is likely to be the right solution for all, given the variability in underlying causes. Thus, tailored approaches are both needed and recommended by the National Academy of Science uh, Expert Consensus Committee. So the challenge we face is how do we stay socially connected at a distance? Well, if you're living with others, it's important to spend quality time and nurture these relationships given the health benefits are linked to high quality relationships and interactions. But regardless of one's living situation, we can offer social support to others. Research demonstrates that the perceptions of availability of support, knowing you can count on others, can help even if no support is received. Further, giving support to others may have an even greater benefit than receiving support. Thus, supporting others helps both you and the other person. Also, we can express gratitude. Research has shown that expressing gratitude promotes social bonds and it has been negatively correlated with loneliness. Research also shows that individuals who interact with people in their neighborhoods or spend time outdoors at least a few times per week were less likely to report a lack of companionship or feeling isolated. Important, importantly, each of these are things that we can do um, and others can do during the pandemic to nurture and strengthen our social connections and stave off loneliness. Recent data just released this month from the National Poll on Healthy Aging found that older adults who regularly engaged in healthy behaviors, including uh, eat, eating healthier, exercising regularly, and getting enough sleep, were also less likely to experience loneliness. During the pandemic, now more than ever, we're also looking to digital tools as a means of social connection. But what do we know about these approaches? Uh, importantly, um, the decades of evidence that have established the protective effects of social connections is primarily based on in-person contact. We currently have less evidence of the equivalencies of connecting via digital means. However, uh, COVID-19 certainly points to a clear need for remote means of connection and effective digital means of connection are certainly needed. So in uh, collaboration with colleagues at uh, UC San Francisco, uh, we just published data actually just out yesterday um, on the experiences of older adults in the San Francisco area during the shelter in place orders um, it, during March and April. 
This was collected via telephone surveys among a small sample of vulnerable community dwelling older adults. What we found is that uh, most older adults use telephones as the primary means of connecting. Uh, however, 76% had little or no video contact and 26% reporting reported having no internet. This is noteworthy given the sample comes from San Francisco. Uh, you know, not, not a rural area, right? Um, but what this data suggests is that many adults um, may not be using digital tools. So it's important when considering digital or other solutions that they're actually reaching those who um, may be in most need. Uh, similarly, uh, data from the National Poll on Healthy Aging suggests that the majority of older, and old, older adults did not use video chat and the use of video chat was unrelated to loneliness. The survey also found that 59% of older adults connected to friends via social media. However, those who used social media were more likely to report feeling isolated. Taken together, these findings suggest that we can't assume all social contact may be equally effective in reducing social isolation and loneliness. And further, we must also think beyond just access to digital tools. Our data also suggests variability among older adults. We can't assume older adults do or do not have access, um, feel comfortable, or desire to use social um, or digital tools. My colleagues and I recently um, conducted another meta-analysis focused on the effect of social interventions on medical patient survival. And this paper is uh, currently under review for publication. Uh, it included 140 randomized clinical trials and over 50,000 participants. And what we found was that there was an, a 15% increase in survival among those receiving social interventions compared to those in control groups and 32% increase in survival time. These suggest uh, significant but modest improvement. Importantly, uh, there was variability. So uh, we uh, conducted follow-up analyses to determine if there were consistent patterns in the types of interventions that were more effective than others. The only variable to consistently predict greater improvement in survival was whether or not the study report, uh, reported improved patient psychosocial functioning. Uh, for example, increased social support, reductions in distress. Interventions that provided social support or resources but didn't actually test whether they improved functioning or did so but improvement didn't occur, these did not improve survival. Thus, we can't just assume that providing social programs is effective. We must actually test them. Um, we also, um, uh, among those that were identified as less successful, we found that psychotherapy um, interventions uh, did not improve uh, patient survival to the extent comparable with other psychosocial interventions. And in interventions, consisting only of remote or home visits did not improve uh, patient survival. So overall, these findings suggest that not all social interventions successfully increase survival and, and tailored approaches really are needed. One comforting sentiment has been the idea that we're all in the same boat a sense of solidarity that we're all in this together and the comfort that you aren't alone in this struggle. However, this analogy may be flawed. Perhaps a better analogy is that we're all facing the same storm, but in different boats. Some of us may be in yachts, others in rowboats, and some of us may be going solo in, in a kayak. We're not all equally equipped to weather this storm. This pandemic has highlighted a number of inequalities, many of which have become magnified in this crisis. This pandemic provides a, an important opportunity for us to better understand these inequalities. Data from both the UK and the US confirm that risk factors that, assist, that existed prior to the pandemic continue to exist during the pandemic. 
These include low income um, or education, unemployed, living alone, or poor mental uh, or physical health, all consistently predicted higher risk. Clearly continued prioritization of social isolation and loneliness is needed. I'd like to just conclude by pointing to the recent 2020 National Academy of Science um, report relevant to this topic, which is available to the public. This report had five goals. First, to develop a more robust evidence base. Second, translate current research into healthcare practices. Third, improve awareness. Fourth, strengthen ongoing education and training. And fifth, strengthen ties between the healthcare system and community-based networks and resources. This report also re provided recommendations related to each one of these goals and is based upon the current available evidence and is certainly, and certainly also currently relevant now. No one sector can solve this issue alone, but together we can begin to make the changes that are so clearly needed. Thank you. Thank you, Julianne. That was, your presentation was incredibly helpful in helping us set the stage and understand the latest research on social isolation and loneliness. <clears throat> With the research you presented as a backdrop, I would now like to turn to our first panel discussion today with local leaders and national experts who will be discussing how social isolation is being addressed, particularly as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as innovative adaptations to meet these unique challenges of our times. And please, if you have questions you would like to ask the panel to address, you can type them into the chat box. The panel will be moderated by Donna Harvey. Donna Harvey is the CEO of the Northeast Iowa Area Agency on Aging and currently serves as the second vice president of the NFRA Board of Directors. The Northeast Iowa Area Agency on Aging administers the National Resource Centers for the State Health Insurance Program and the Senior Medicare Patrol Program. She's also served as the State Unit on Aging Director and was a previous N4A board president. Donna also serves on the advisory committee for the Engaged National Resource Center. Donna, I'm gonna to turn to you to provide opening remarks for the panel and to introduce the panelists. Thank you, and I'm so happy to be here today with so many experts around uh, the table with me. Were we together uh, like we would be in the past? So um, again, my name is Donna Harvey and I reside in Northeast Iowa, a pretty rural part of the country. Uh, I'm guessing not a lot of you have been in Iowa because that seems to be uh, the typical response when I say where we're from. And no, we don't grow potatoes, we grow corn. So just to make sure you're clear on that. So what I would say is the past few months um, have really given us some great challenges. And I feel like at times we're the flying Wallendas. We're trying to balance the safety of older people with the need for addressing social isolation. And I see some heads nodding uh, with my friends. And so we have started out on a very basic approach in that we use telephone to connect with a lot of our consumers. Uh, and we set out and gave key questions that we ask every week. The first one was, do you have technology in which you connect? And then the second question is, and to whom do you connect? Well, we knew it would be a pretty small number, but we were a bit shocked to find that less than 20% of our consumers, a thousand of them, um, had internet access or a smartphone or a computer. And so we then got together and tried to figure out how are we gonna connect? How are we gonna keep folks engaged with us going forward? Um, we also then reached out to our volunteers and what we're finding um, is that a lot of those, of course, are in the elder category themselves. They isolated at the same time that our consumers isolated. And so we've been trying to stay engaged with them. Uh, we send them cards, we send them gifts, we're trying to keep them active. But just recently, we um, re-engaged with all of our consumers that used to go to our congregate meal programs, senior centers and ask, how do you feel about returning? 
what we found is 97% said we want to go back. <laughs> we will wear masks. We will follow all the cautionary steps we need, but we need to see our friends. My mother's 84, lives in a very small town in Iowa, Was went to the senior center every day. She's on the board. She has a you know, pretty important role. And she said the same thing. They are now gathering to do socialization, not eat. So I think... Um, I, I think we need to listen to our consumers at the same time. Again, that flying Walenda approach to what does that look like? We have engaged technology in a technological manner with our consumers differently. We've been holding Facebook Live. We hold two a week. One is evidence-based, um, and we work very close with our friends at NCOA to make those adaptations. And the other is an education. So we have done things like how to plant um, a, a container garden, how to use your refrigerated items and to read the dates and what can you do to create recipes. So we try to think about things that they would be facing in their daily lives and how can we support them in that. We've been holding conference calls because not everybody has Zoom. And those have been really successful with our caregiver support groups. And as we proceeded through the days, what we found is our caregivers were incredibly isolated and feeling uh, the extra burden. And so we have implemented the use of grand pads. The reason we like that platform is it's on a cellular base, not internet. And so in our most rural areas, we've been able to connect everybody. And, and one of the nice stories I like to tell is that we had an older gentleman call in tears saying he was able to see all of his children on his birthday and he had Parkinson's and he said, honestly, I've not done that for the last several years. So I think, you know, there are some silver linings in all of this that we need to capture and carry forward. So um, the other piece I'll tell you, we are very blessed. <laughs> we have received the National Resource Center grant from ACL to support the SHIP program and the Senior Medicare Patrol or SMP programs. And so our staff have been very busy trying to modify as we get ready for the enrollment for Medicare upcoming, how do volunteers engage with consumers to make those critical enrollment choices for Part D and for um, their, and to review their current coverage. And so they have spent a lot of time um, researching and finding ways on how do you protect your own phone number when you're making calls from home, um, going through, I, I think it's a Google product. And also then the same thing, if you have to ship materials, how can you do that from a home base and protect your identity. So uh, they have put together many products. You can see those on uh, both the Resource Center for a SHIP and SMP. Some of those are front facing. I think ACL also has those on those websites. But that's an ongoing challenge to us um, as to how do we adapt those programs like all of you so that we stay engaged with everybody uh, to keep them healthy and, and they love those phone calls every week. So I will say that's our most successful. And now I want to turn to our four friends here uh, to let them talk about their approaches and then we'll get some time for some question and answers. So I'm going to start with Sue Lackemeyer. Sue is the state program coordinator for the Maryland Living Well Center of Excellence. I love that name. It's so positive. So good for you. Um, and that's a division of the MAC Area Agency on Aging. They've received funding from the AARP Foundation to work with Texas, a Texas A&M researcher, Matthew Smith, and have developed a validated social isolation risk screener. And it actually connects the zip code with the resources available. So I can't wait to hear more, Sue, about how that works and how we might steal it across the nation. And, and then we have sure. Elizabeth. Pulaski, who's the National Director of Tutoring Partnerships and Expansion. So that's quite the dual. You, get, you have to do the tutoring and expand it at the same time through the OASIS Institute. OASIS has the largest tutoring, um, school-based intergenerational tutoring program uh, in the U.S. So you can only imagine what happened come March when all the schools closed down and how they quickly changed uh, to their virtual program. So we'll be anxious to see how that's going and, and where you want to go in the future. Then we have Lauren Pongen, who is the National Director of Diverse Elders Coalition. 
Um, during the pandemic, the six member organizations have worked together to adapt their services for the communities, and that includes racially and ethically diverse older adults, American Indian and Alaska Natives, lesbian, gay, and or transgender older adults. So that will help all of us kind of make sure we're reaching out to those most isolated populations. So Lauren, we look forward to your, your presentation to us. And then Jennifer Tripkin is the Associate D Director for the Healthy Aging at the National Council on Aging. And she stepped forward to fill in for somebody who had an emergency. So thank you very much, Jennifer, for joining us. And they support um, the expansion and sustainability of evidence-based programs and disease prevention, both in the community and now online. So we'll be anxious to see how, how you're doing with all that. So Sue, would you like to give us a little overview of what you're doing? I would love to, Donna. And just to let you know, my grandparents were in Meadow Grove, Nebraska. I visited Iowa often. You know, I think we're yeah. sort of from the same same community there. And thanks so much for mentioning the work that we're doing. I will say that we did a webinar yesterday, uh, September 23rd at two o'clock, identifying upstream risk of social isolation and steps for prevention. So if you missed it, I'm sure that the recordings of the webinars will be available later. And really the tool that we developed, again with our great colleague, uh, Dr. Matthew Smith, was to really validate uh, social isolation and, and loneliness uh, tool here. We utilized over 4,000 diverse older adults. Uh, the tool has 13 basic questions plus some demographics. It's called the Users Upstream Isolation Risk Screener. And it does really identify, and, and I think we just heard from Jennifer, uh, earlier that, you know, it's a complex issue. So there is loneliness and then there's both physical and emotional, emotional size, uh, social isolation. We are th thrilled in that recently through uh, uh, the research, we've been able to sort of narrow the questions down to four key questions for the initial screener. And then if someone does respond positively at risk, under those four questions, you would go ahead and trigger the other questions for more details. Uh, the backend algorithm really triggers over 40 different programs and services in 11 different domains. And you're right, right now it is, it's uh, linked to the elder care locator for zip code, but again, a lot of the information can be tailored. It's something that people could take on their own, but it's much more effective if it's done in connection with someone who's working with them. So really an important program. And during COVID, you know, we did a number of, of different things. Uh, the Living Well Center actually was asked by our Maryland Department of Aging to stand up a caregiver command core to really link older adults and people with disabilities who needed services during COVID. In other words, somebody who maybe uh, their caregivers were missing, maybe they they didn't need a caregiver up until then, uh, all kinds of things. And so that's still running. Uh, we really did literally link people to a myriad of services, uh, including volunteer caregivers. And the most requested services, and I think most of you will really relate to this, of course, home delivered and shelf stable meals, transportation, telehealth, access and training and i think we've heard that you know throughout the conversation already this morning how tremendously important uh it connectivity is uh regardless of where you are and again i'm on uh the lower shore of eastern maryland now and so you know i understand rural that's the kinds of communities we have over here uh, so our partner really to do this uh, command center was Eagle Force Health, which is a national web and mobile platform. It assists patients to track their own medical information. It provides evidence-based approach that ties both clinical and community so that you're really treating that entire patient and their needs. And so that's really been an important component for us. Uh, as you know, we're a triple A. AAA, and, and then Living Well is under that and Leanne Eagle and Eagle Force have really been working on this IT connectivity. It's so critically important. They've been working to build uh, 5G phones and tablets 
that have a wide array of resources on them, including telehealth connectivity, including uh, patient monitoring if it's needed, if it's something around blood glucose levels or other things, uh, the ability to actually access some of our evidence-based programs, unlimited text and phone data. The tablets can be ordered and reimbursed through physician practices, but we're really looking here in Maryland at piloting it with our, our AAAs, developing it so that they can put it out on loan or while they're delivering evidence-based programs and some of the services, and then bringing those back. And it's really got an affordable uh, price to it. So we're really excited about that. And uh, really it's, it's a program that we're, as I said, piloting here in Maryland, but Oregon and Western New York are also onboarding into the system. So we're really excited about this potential. And it's pretty clear we are not going to go back from virtual. We're going to need it from now on, even though it may not be our ideal way. Sounds great. If you look in the questions, they're coming in for you, Sue, so we'll get to those later. So Elizabeth, can you bring us up to speed? Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me as part of the panel. What an honor. Um, so just a little bit more background about OASIS um, is we are a, a national nonprofit promoting healthy aging through lifelong learning, active lifestyles, and volunteer engagement for older adults. And as Donna mentioned, um, I'm in charge of our biggest volunteer program, which is in our intergenerational tutoring program. We have about 5,000 tutors across the United States and 82 different school districts. Um, it's been successful for 31 years. We are in school program. You know, we pride ourselves on getting those older adults out of their homes and into the school districts, you know, at least once a week. They spend their hour with their child and, you know, get to know the community and get to know the school a little bit better too. So, you know, again, um, we are in school program utilizing the magic of real books and intergenerational connections. So when something happened, you know, it, when COVID happened and we had the, started the longest spring break ever in March, um, we quickly had to figure out a way to keep our Oasis tutors active and engaged. Um, again, part of the concern was they didn't have a, a chance even to say goodbye to their students. Um, you know, they were they were very active and in the community, then all of a sudden, you know, the world just stopped. So we spent, the tutoring team spent the months of April and May really just trying to figure out how to keep them connected and keep them engaged. Um, sending them videos, doing weekly blogs, um, making sure that they were, you know, still safe and healthy, but, you know, staying home. Um, our next job is really to figure out how could we mirror the in-person tutoring experience um, in a virtual way. So we were very lucky to have an existing partnership with the county library here in the St. Louis area. And we had partnered with them last summer and had two branches where we offered free tutoring in the summer during their summer programs. Um, we had big plans over the summer to make that nine sessions, nine branches, which of course that didn't happen. But we were able, able to pivot and offer virtual tutoring sessions um, with our existing tutors. Um, we had 50 tutors that initially had expressed an interest in the training, and we were thrilled that 25 of them continued after our first training sessions in lots and lots and lots of practice. Um, it wasn't just, you know, training them how to, it was training them how to turn on their computer sometimes and training, what is this Zoom thing and what buttons do I push and what buttons don't I push? And, so it was, you know, training them on technology, but also training them um, to still be that tutor and that special friend to that person on the screen. Um, the tutors, the, the students got it immediately. Um, these kids are used to um, being on screen and connecting. Um, they, they were ready to go the moment the screen opened up and there was a book on the screen and the older adult was reading to them, they were ready to go. Um, our tutors, as I said, took a little bit longer, but you could see them gradually um, even just in the first session, just feeling more and more comfortable engaging in this new and, you know, different way for them. Um, the, the group of 25 tutors that, um, that actually, you know, did this program with us considered themselves, quote unquote, pioneers in virtual tutoring. Um, they love that word. They said, you know, we're the first people to try this. And so um, not a lot of research is on virtual tutoring, so they really are pioneers. Um, so after 300 total sessions over the summer in a six-week time period, we learned a lot. 
Um, it really, uh, we learned that, you know, an hour is our typical session, way too long for older adults and for kids. Um, 30 minutes was a much better time frame. Um, again, kids are accustomed to learning online. Um, and intergenerational connections happened. So virtual or not, it really happened. Uh, we also discovered that virtual tutoring is not for everyone. Um, there is, we, we, we consider about 50% of our tutors are not gonna try this option. And so we actually went very old school and developed over the summer a pen pal program um, that kept our tutors engaged and um, able to, you know, to connect with their children, but in an old school kind of way. Um, still teaching them, um, you know, mentoring, but over, you know, over, over handwriting and friendly letters. So in addition to this, um, OASIS also has gone completely virtual. As I mentioned, one of our approaches is lifelong learning. And we have been doing all of our lifelong learning classes over Zoom. So they're highly interactive. They're not just videos that you watch. You actually get to interact with the instructor. Um, we've been opening our classes 15 minutes early to provide an opportunity for them to socialize. Um, we encourage them the questions. And so even though they're sitting in their living room, we want it to still feel like they're having an interactive class. Um, also, we launched Oasis Everywhere, which is a virtual site that basically is the best of Oasis classes from across the United States. Um, history classes, health classes, exercise classes, technology. Um, it's, you know, it, it's the best that we have from across the United States and across from our nine centers. Um, and participants come from different states. And again, it's a way of interacting um, without you know, being in the same room. And finally, we also have Conversations That Count, which is a telephone-based program that helps older adults cope with life's transitions. So these are for those people, again, maybe not high tech, but you still can join a call and still have interaction and still be um, you know, interacting with other people. Um, so some of us have called this this pivot, the pivot year. Um, you know, COVID wasn't just a pivot for Oasis and for most organizations working in the school districts as well as working with older adults. It's a complete 360. I don't call it a pivot anymore. I call it a 360. Um, we had to rethink everything we did, again, with older adults and in the school system and our volunteers did too. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Jennifer, let's hear what NCOA is doing. Great, thank you so much for having me. I'm really pleased to be here. I wanted to first provide a little bit of background on the National Council on Aging. So NCOA is the longest serving national organization focused on aging. Since 1950, NCOA's mission has been to improve the lives of older adults. And our vision is a just and caring society in which each of us as we age lives with dignity, purpose, and security. Our goal is to improve the lives of 40 million older adults by 2030. Now, reducing social isolation is ubiquitous in all of NCOA's work, especially during the coronavirus pandemic. In response to the pandemics, NCOA developed the COVID-19 Resource Center for both aging network professionals and older adults, which can be found on our homepage on our website. We also responded by quickly identifying the needs of older adults and our aging network partners to provide support through both technical assistance and collaboration to share best practices and lessons learned. Well, NCOA supports older adults through a number of initiatives that promote, promote aging well, including ensuring economic and financial security. I'd like to share today with you a snapshot of how NCOA is working to reduce social isolation through our engagement with our aging network partners to support their efforts to improve the physical and mental health of older adults while upholding the physical distancing recommendations and orders to shelter in place and stay at home. Across the nation, Community-based organizations that provide vital services to enable older adults to stay in their own homes are struggling to continue supporting their clients during this time. In April and July 2020, NCOA sur surveyed over more, excuse me, more than 890 community-based organizations to understand this impact. In April, respondents reported that the needs of older adults included needing help with picking up groceries or meal deliveries and or accessing masks, gloves, and other cleaning supplies. In July, interestingly, the needs of older adults had shifted from food and supplies to primarily staying socially connected. As expected, most community-based organizations reported a halt in in-person programs and services, such as health promotion programs and congregate meal services. Not only are organizations reporting a loss of revenue and workforce, 
but the volunteer network that organization, organizations rely on for the provision of many services has been reduced significantly. Now, despite these setbacks, community-based organizations have res responded to the needs of their community by increasing home-delivered meals and take-home meals, and more than 90% of organizations have reported that they are now delivering services online or by telephone. For example, a 2018 Administration on Aging Nutrition Innovations grantee in Atlanta has created a cafe through a connection with their food bank and local hospital. It provides nutritious food, chronic disease self-management, and nutrition education to enhance your communities and employees' health, reduce healthcare costs, and reduce social isolation. The National Council on Aging is home to the National Institute of Senior Centers, otherwise known as NISC. NISC supports and strengthens the nation's 11,000 senior centers through best practices, professional development, advocacy, research, and national standards and accreditation. In response to the pandemic, NISC has reached out to the senior center professionals to gather operating ideas during the crisis. We have found that much has changed in the course of a few months, but the one constant that has been the same is the ability of senior center professionals to think creatively, practically, and decisively to continue to promote wellness for older adults in their communities. NISC has developed a resource guide called Senior Centers Connection that includes best practices for remote programming and service continuity ideas. NISC is also actively holding webinars on COVID-19 resources for senior centers, both on remote program services and on guidance for resuming in-person operations. This national collaboration has brought together senior centers from across the country to learn about, from, and with each other. In particular, one of the most common ways that senior centers are connecting to their communities are through telephonic reassurance calls and engagement, otherwise known as wellness checks. For example, in Minnesota, senior centers are calling their members and asking three basic questions. Do you have food? Do you have access to your medications? And do you have your critical health issues met? The senior center then works to connect older adults to clinical and other community-based services that can help address their needs. This can easily be adapted to ask questions around social isolation and loneliness, and then work to refer those who are at risk to appropriate resources. In honor of Senior Center Month, which is this September, the theme of delivering vital connections was chosen to highlight how senior centers deliver those vital connections to support older adults aging well. Preventing social isolation is vital and a core senior center mission. While the delivery methods have changed during the pandemic, senior centers have succeeded in continuing to provide knowledge, programming, and resources. Next, I'd like to share how NCOA is helping to support older adults physical and mental health through the Administration for Community Living funded National Chronic Disease Self-Management Education and Falls Prevention Resource Centers. These centers are housed at the Center for Healthy Aging at NCOA, and we immediately turned our technical assistance and support efforts to helping community-based organizations across the country continue to deliver their programs that address chronic disease self-management and falls prevention, but in a new manner. These evidence-based programs are research-based and have shown to have health-promoting qualities, including increased social support and social capital. While the primary purpose of these programs are to increase self-management of chronic disease and to prevent falls, they do offer secondary benefits to increasing the social connectivity to others and reducing social isolation. We believe it is critical that older adults have access to these programs to not only help them stay healthy and out of hospitals, but also to keep them socially engaged during this time of physical distancing. NCOA is the go-to resource for information on acceptable evidence-based program adaptations and also guidance for remote delivery. We are proud to support the program developers and the implementation sites across the nation, especially those who are funded by the Administration for Community Living, to adapt these important programs for online and telephonic delivery. With this support, Older adults can still receive the benefits of these programs, including social connectedness, while remaining safe and physically distanced. One of the first steps NCOA took when the pandemic started was to launch Grand Rounds, a weekly Zoom call for organizations to receive information on best practices and strategies to deliver programming remotely. All sessions are recorded and include links to resources developed by organizations for others to use and to adapt to their communities. These calls have been well received by the network, with more than 200 aging network and healthcare professionals joining the calls on a regular basis. 
Grand Rounds topics has ranged from best practices in using technology to engaging adults to participate in these health promotion programs to retaining workforce, especially those who are volunteers. These calls have also included ideas on new and innovative partnerships to address how do we redefine community in the remote space, including sharing of resources for cost savings and increased older adult engagement in programs and services. We've also been collecting examples of partnerships to address the digital divide. These innovative partnerships have been able to identify how to bring laptops, tablets, and smartphones into the hands of older adults so they can connect to telehealth, family and friends, and virtual healthy aging programs. For example, some organizations are able to form partnerships with broadband uh, companies to put new hotspots in targeted areas, such as the community library parking lot, and have older adults engage in programming using technology that they would otherwise not have been able to. One organization is working with assisted living facilities to incorporate healthy aging programs into their television streaming services, even with an option to install a webcam through the television to allow for that two-way interaction, but without the hassle of understanding how to use a computer or tablet. These innovations are scratching the surface of what is possible through partnership and collaboration. What we have learned over the past few months is that first, more funding is critically needed by the aging network organizations to deliver programs remotely. Funding is needed to support staff training, remote platform licenses, data collection, and also have additional staff to train older adults in using these platforms. Through our work with the aging network, we have been able to engage with partners to collaborate, to learn from each other, and to share these best practices to keep engaging older adults in the programs and services that will help them thrive as they age and we know part of thriving is staying socially connected. We are confident that it is this collaborative spirit of the Aging Network that will allow us to continue innovation in the provision of these life-saving services and achieve our collective mission, vision of improving the lives of older adults. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay, Lauren, do you want to give us an overview of what you're doing and then we're gonna tackle some of the questions that have come in. Sure, thanks, Donna. Um, Good morning, everyone, or I guess it might be afternoon by now. I'm in California on the West Coast, so it's just afternoon here. Um, my name is Lauren Pongan. I use she and her pronouns, and I am the relatively new director, national director of the Diverse Elders Coalition. So I actually interviewed and onboarded during the pandemic, so I could really relate, Elizabeth, to maybe what your tutors were going through in that new process and trying to do everything online. Um, the Diverse Elders Coalition, or the DEC, was founded in 2010, and we we're made up of six organizations. So I will read those for you. But the National Asian Pacific Center on Aging, the National Caucus and Center on Black Aging, the National Hispanic Council on Aging, the National Indian Council on Aging, SAGE Advocacy and Services for LGBT Elders, and the Southeast Asian Resource Action Center. So what we do at the DEC as a collection of these six organizations is to advocate for policies and programs that improve aging in our communities, and which, as Donna mentioned before, those communities are racially and ethnically diverse older adults, American Indians and Native Alaskans, and lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. So in these programmatic solutions that we're advocating for, we're hoping to remove barriers that our communities face moving forward as our demographics continue to grow in the aging space. And as Dr. Holt Lundsted highlighted in her earlier presentation, you know, we know, understand that social isolation has real, grave, real and grave consequences, especially for diverse elders that the DEC serves. Um, these elders from these communities are often already really impacted, not just by social isolation and, and the regular issues of aging, but also through social determinants of health and increased isolation um, due to linguistic differences, et cetera. Um, so members, our membership is a mix. It's not, it's, it's kind of, it's pretty diverse. It's a mix of different large national organizations, community serving organizations. Some of them have housing facilities. Some of them have day, um, day community centers, et cetera. So it's all the interventions that the DEC has implemented, DEC membership have implemented have been very diverse and really tailored to the populations that they're hoping to serve, including even if they're reaching out in rural communities or if it's New York City. Um, so the interventions vary widely to address social isolation, especially in this time. Um, in general, you know, we've heard about from all the other panelists, which has been awesome and really inspiring about some of the different and creative interventions that are happening around the country. But what happens 
I, I mean, those interventions are hard enough in the pandemic when you're just reaching out to sort of a blanket population, right? But what happens when your population has really specific considerations, ethnic, linguistic, or cultural? Um, I can in no way cover all of the interventions that the memberships have developed over the past few months, but I wanted to bring a couple highlights just to give you an idea of how people are tailoring solutions for the communities that they work with. So Sage, for example, who as a reminder, works with the LGBT community of age of older adults. A lot of the elders in that community don't necessarily have biological kids. They have chosen family. They don't necessarily have people checking in on them in the same way or live in intergenerational households the way some of our other populations do. So Sage has really gone back to hotlines um, they've adapt they they have a 24 7 hotline for older adults and a lot of them who are lgbt are still maybe closeted so it's an opportunity to reach in privacy reach out and combat social isolation by talking on the phone to someone who can know who they are um, if they're not out to their family their biological family for example um, sage has also adapted their volunteer network to make sure that volunteers have converted to either virtual visits or change the pace of visiting, understanding that while maybe before the pandemic, they were only doing weekly phone calls, now they may need to up it to two or three because that might be one of the only points of social contact that they have in a given week. Um, the National Indian Council on Aging is adapting by using, they just purchased um, a train by cell software system to help older adult workers in the native Alaskan American Indian community to be reached and to do trainings without without computers, which I think a couple of people touched on this, but phone, not everyone has a laptop, not everyone has a tablet. So kind of meeting people where they're at on the technological front has been really instrumental. And then lastly, and just another quick highlight is the National Hispanic Council on Aging. They've totally shifted to Teletown Hall for providing regular community updates. And it's great because it's a way to have that two-way interaction. And then also you can bring in important speakers that people want to hear from. So they invite policymakers, community leaders, medical providers, and they can tackle all sorts of issues and questions that are coming up. I know they recently did a um, presentation and published a blog on how to decipher the difference between influenza and COVID-19 symptoms. So really bringing those pivotal messages and they're able to do that in a teletown hall bilingually. Um, so those are, those are just a couple brief highlights. As I mentioned, I, there's no way I can cover everything, um, but I just wanted to give a glimpse of how people are taking cultural and cultural and linguistic considerations into the interventions and solutions they're building. Um, and that's generally just what the DEC always advocates for is really coming up with tailored approaches to serving those communities. That's great, thank you so much. And I think you're right, sometimes we try to make it hard versus reaching out to our partners to try to see what's already working and how can we replicate that. So thank you for a gentle nudge and reminder of that. So I see we have quite a few questions come in. Um, I'm just going to read down through the list once for me. So I'm going to address it very, very briefly. So I talked about grandpads and it's how did we make the decision of who got them? We actually used the CARES Fund and Family First funding for um, caregiver and we focused in on our caregivers first and those in rural areas without computer access. So we kind of um, started there. We've now expanded some of that into case management and we focused on those who did not have active family or support systems and, and that's how we've done it. And we're working with our state units to figure out how do we fund that uh, going forward because we know that's an intervention that's going to work into the future. So the question, uh, the next one I'm going to give to you, Sue, even though I jumped one, and it's they would like to know how can they get more information about that the screening tool. I believe they're going to put our emails at the end, but can you just maybe give them how to get a hold of you so they can learn more about that? Sure, uh, you can reach any any one of us who's working on it, and and uh, you know I'm happy to just if you like put my or maybe somebody can put put my uh, email in you can certainly email me and i can help you i can tell you what it is it's b as in boy s as in sam l a c h at earthlink.net great 
Thank you. I think that's one that we're all going to want to see at some point and, and build into our program. So get ready. You could be inundated with emails. So um, I like this one. What is your best creative idea for senior volunteer engagement that is? Most creative approach. I think just meeting the volunteers and the tutors where they were. Um, they they didn't all, not all of them felt comfortable with a virtual learning, um, but some of them were able to make some phone calls for us and just follow up with other other volunteers. So again, I think creativity is is beyond just technology at this point. Um, you know, allowing them, you know, someone had mentioned, you know, catching them where they are and making them feel comfortable. Um, not everyone's going to feel comfortable on the phone or on a computer, but. Um, we found some ways to um, to adapt to some of our some of our our um, volunteer programs that were in um, they were actually doing um, emails and reminding people of classes. Now they're doing the same thing with a phone call. So and you know sending Zoom links out. So they've learned from that process too. So creative, I don't know, but that's what we've been doing. Yeah. That's where it works. That's the important part. So Lauren, you offered several, but do you have any others in your pocket that you want to share? Um, yeah, I guess I would like to go into a little more detail about Sage. I think that they adapted their programs really interestingly. Um, they have five um, community centers in New York City and they're in the process of building two um, low income housing units. So they have quite a lot of on the ground programming centered in this diverse urban area that we know was really hard hit by the, by the pandemic. Um, one thing that I've loved about their program, their volunteer program, was first distributing tablets so that people could have, I, I think they Sage is running around 100 programs a week. So trying to give people access to those things and sending programming tablets and sending them to people's homes. I know that they're writing several grants now to try to get increased support for that, to try to make it more feasible for more people. Um, expanding check-in calls, they moved their food to grab and go. But one of the one of the pairings that I liked a lot was um, they received Uber gift certificates um, for seniors. And what they're doing is actually having um, when when their when their volunteer is paired to meet them. So either through a home visit with social distancing or through over the phone, they're actually ordering dinner for them through the Uber Eats app getting it to their house and then having virtual dinner together. Um, so I have really liked that as a model because there's nothing like sharing food with someone when you're feeling lonely. And I think it's been a great adaptation. That's great. Thank you. Jennifer, anything creative you want to share that you've heard? You've shared some in your presentation, but anything else that you can think of? Yes, um, one thing that comes to mind is that we have uh, heard from a lot of organizations that volunteers um, too need some support when preparing to interact with their communities. And just like we've heard from the time and, and kind of the, the time and the kind of tediousness it takes to help older adults, you know, get enrolled into a program and get used to the technology, that our volunteers need that as well. Those who are leading a program, those who are doing the wellness calls, that we need to offer support for them as well and opportunities to be comfortable with technology or the telephone. And there have been some creative ideas such as mentoring. So someone who is uh, a fairly proficient technology user can be paired up with a volunteer who is a little less comfortable and they work together in the beginning to increase that comfort level. There are practice sessions where leaders of programs, these leaders are often volunteers, can actually practice delivering a program over the technology to try to work out the kinks before actually delivering it to those older adults in the community. So I guess our, our lesson learned would be that just like older adults need support in getting enrolled in programs and actively engaging, that those volunteers too need that same opportunity and support. So having those, that ability to support them is important as well. Very good, thank you. And Sue, any ideas, thoughts you wanna share, tidbits? Sure, I think one of the first things that happened here in Maryland when we knew we needed to shelter in place was we did outreach to everyone who was involved in any of our wellness programs by phone. 
Uh, so that meant our GEM, the current members, previous members, that meant the folks who had been in evidence-based programs. It meant, uh, again, we we get a lot of our referrals directly from providers, from physicians, and oftentimes that individual will say, well, no, I'm not interested in a program, even though we do motivational interviewing to try to engage them. And so when we did those calls, those outreach calls, it was very interesting. First of all, those folks who had chosen not to be engaged in other programs, other resources, were faring much worse uh, than those who had been at, at, uh, involved in an evidence-based program or in the gym or something like that. But one of the key findings, we, we would do reach out and do the social isolation screener with folks, and the individuals who had been connected through various services indicated they were so thrilled to actually go through those questions because it made them understand it was the times that we're in not them in terms of really feeling socially isolated and and part of you know of the the tool really also has steps in it not only connecting you to resources, but steps you might want to think about taking on your own as well. So that, that I think was really helpful and certainly rewarding to all of the outreach team that did it. And I think that's, we're all searching for what is normal in our life. So that's, that's yep. interesting and um, eye-opening. So good for sharing that. So we only have nine minutes left. It doesn't seem like long, but by the time we all talk a couple of minutes. So the question that I'm going to share, ask you next, comes uh, from someone that just said, they're having a difficult time finding the socially mm -hmm. isolated. Um, what is a good outreach tool or maybe even how do you define that so you know what you're looking for? So anybody want to start in first and then we'll just go around the circle? I can, I can um, offer that I think, you know, before I came to the Diverse Elders Coalition, I have come from a history of working in the Asian American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community um, and working at direct service organizations. and direct service organizations, especially ethnic linguistic specific ones within a certain geographic area, they know their people and um, they will be the ones providing services. And they're the trusted organization. They're the, they're the gate, not the gatekeepers, but they're the sort of entry point to public benefits, to healthcare, to enrollment, to, um, to any variety of social services. So I think especially for programs that are looking to better serve diverse communities, meaningful partnerships with community-based organizations that serve those organizations um, are a really great starting point for reaching them. And when I say meaningful, I don't just mean um, a diversity sort of check the box for serving this community. It might require sharing resources. It might require writing them into grant proposals, um, doing the extra work to hire staff that reflects the community, getting, you know, providing meaningful language access, both in translated written materials, as well as having interpretation. So I think um, I would encourage, I would highly encourage if you're looking to expand your programs and engage those constituencies, really look out for meaningful partnerships with the CBOs that are um, providing services already. Very good, thank you. Anyone else have anything to add to that? This is Sue. I want to just echo exactly what Lauren said. Uh, and we work very closely with our area health education centers and community health workers throughout the state of Maryland. And exactly right, they are in community, they are trusted, they are recognized. And they're the ones that really are able to identify and, and reach people so frequently. So it, it's similar exactly. I, I think it's, it's a, an important strategy. Okay, great. So I'm going to ask one final question so you all start thinking. What was your one aha moment that you had as you were trying to make the transformation of your programs or as you're getting ready to go forward? Who's ready? Jennifer, are you ready for that one? Oh, Elizabeth sure. said she is. So we'll start with, okay, we'll start with who wants to go, Jennifer or Elizabeth? Go ahead. Jennifer. Elizabeth, after you. Okay. Well, too polite, I think, 
<laughs> we're so polite on, on Zoom, aren't we? Um, I think our biggest aha moment was we were so impressed and almost shocked that our volunteers wanted to do this work virtually. Um, one of them actually said to us, that's why I signed up for the summer program because I'm isolated. I needed to learn this for myself and to learn how to interact virtually with my grandkids and with my children. And so I was, we were just shocked as an organization that um, they were willing to, to adapt. So pleasantly surprised, I guess I should say, is you know, we were, the aha moment was that they were ready to go when we were and ready to pivot. That's great. Jennifer. Yes, thank you. Um, and that, that's wonderful to, to hear. Um, I guess our aha moment or what we've taken away from this, in particular myself who's been uh, working on those grand rounds calls that I've mentioned before, is kind of the courage um, and the inspiration um, from others um, has really been a motivating factor for this work. I think one of the aha moments for, for us was that we knew that together we can achieve more, but only when faced with this deep challenge were we forced to break down those silos that have long stood in the way of progress and innovation, and that we're starting to see community be redefined in a way that transcends our jurisdictions and our borders in other ways. So we have kind of this balance of being cautious with, without taking action, or the, the balance of taking too much action and throwing caution to the wind, and it's finding that middle ground and making those partnerships and, of course, keeping that collaborative spirit, that collaborative spirit intact, which has really been um, both inspirational, um, but I know it takes courage on the behalf of not only organizations, but leaders and the older adults that we serve to step forward into this new terrain of, of remote and telephonic and just dealing with the, everything that comes with addressing our needs during this time. Great. Thank you. Do you have an aha moment? So I would say, you know, Leanne Eagle is really a visionary leader and, and her understanding and recognizing early on that we have to be able to connect with people and have that resource that is virtual in some way. And it really did, Jennifer, jump in with both feet, I will tell you. So that partnership that we've forged and the, the work that we're starting to do with that is, is really exciting. And we talked earlier before we started to say, you know, we're, we know we are not going to go back to what we had before. Uh, we are going to be entering a new world and certainly virtually linking with people will be a main part of that. So we have to be able to have both the technology and resources and be able to do it better. I mean, Zoom is great, but we've got to figure out some ways uh, that that connection is really meaningful and significant. Awesome. Lauren? Sure, two things came to mind for me. One was, you know, the, the Diverse Elders Coalition and its members have been really focused on caregiving um, the last year or two and what caregivers needs are in the diverse elder space and so one aha moment for me was around um, resourcing the caregivers themselves as an intervention point for providing better wraparound care to diverse elders and continuing to offer those supports especially in a flexible way around covid and in a way that's responsive to emerging needs as the pandemic develops and changes um, and secondly is um, just the importance of community-driven solutions, I think because we're a membership organization with six different constituencies, you know, the communities know they're resilient, people know what works best for themselves. Um, so being able to leverage and share across different communities best practices in order to inspire each other and try different things, as well as identifying kind of from um, an uh, eagle eye view what we're seeing as pervasive issues in the communities, and then thinking about creative advocacy strategies on the policy advocacy side for addressing those in the longer term. Great. So I would say our aha moment, or maybe it's just mine, is that honestly we found our consumers to be a little bit more flexible than my staff. <laughs> um, I think my staff wanted to limit what is the interest and ability of our older consumers and our older consumers were ready to try new things. So I think that has been a good challenge for us. 
Um, but I also want to then circle to another question we didn't get to, but it's how are we measuring outcomes? And I, I think just quickly, I would say, I think that's a question we're all still asking ourselves is how are we measuring it now and how will we measure it in the future? And I think there's two, that's two different steps. So I think that is an opportunity um, for all of us to think about how do we engage <laughs> differently and measure those outcomes. So in, in closing, I just wanna say, this has been an amazing uh, hour with all of you. It went very, very quickly. I feel like I've made new friends, new acquaintances and new people to come after to get ideas. So thank you very much taking time to spend with us. And I, I hope all of our listeners are just as enthused as I am about where do we go in the future. So enjoy the rest of your day and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Donna, Sue, Elizabeth, Lauren, and Jennifer for participating in this panel and sharing your expertise and insights. I, for one, learned so much from the information and best practices interventions you presented. We'll look forward to further highlighting and sharing your great work through the Engaged Resource Center. Now, as part of our discussing adaptations to address social engagement during COVID-19, I heard several of you touch on the role of technology. We want to take a deeper dive on that topic next and discuss how low-tech and high-tech options are sparking greater connectivity and learn how older adults can access technology, opportunities for technology training, and much more. Again, if you have questions you would like to ask the panel to address, you can type them into the chat box. This panel will be moderated by Lori Gerhardt. Lori is the Director of the Office of Interagency Innovation at the U.S. Administration for Community Living and has been at ACL since 2007. In her role, Lori facilitates and develops partnerships with other federal departments and HHS agencies on innovative activities, policies and technical assistance to advance federal resources to address social determinants of health and is spearheading with ACL colleagues, a stakeholder group focused on social isolation. Lori, I now turn it to you to provide opening remarks for our technology panel and to introduce the panelists. Well, thank you, Sandy, and good afternoon, and welcome to our session to share information on how technology is fostering engagement during the coronavirus. The coronavirus has forced us to rethink how we engage in routine activities and technology has been a solution. Although many of us, it's a new thing. You know, we're not familiar with the technology devices and sometimes there's features built into them that we don't know about. Um, so we've got some exciting information to share during this panel. And first I'd like to talk, you about, talk to you about the partnerships that we are engaged in to address social isolation. So earlier today, you heard from my colleague, Greg Link, about our investment in Engaged, the National Resource Center for Engaging Older Adults, led by N4A. In addition to this investment to address social isolation, through the CARES Act, we issued Aging and Disability Resource Center No Wrong Door System grants to states and territories to build partnerships with colleagues to increase access to assistive technology, address social isolation, facilitate care transitions, and serve older adults and people with disabilities in this new environment. Approximately 21 states are working in partnership with their State Assistive Technology Act programs to increase access to assistive technology, and a subset of states are working together to address social isolation. Two states that come to mind are Virginia and Connecticut, and I'd like to share a little bit of information about the strategies Connecticut is using. Connecticut CARES Act, Connecticut's CARES Act Stay Connected program is a collaborative effort led by Connecticut's No Wrong Door System and includes the Connecticut State Unit on Aging, Connecticut's Tech Act program, five area agencies on aging, five centers for independent living, three assistive technology partners, and Quinnipiac University School of Nursing. The Stay Connected program utilizes Professor Nicholas R. Nicholson's six question social isolation scale to identify older adults and individuals with disabilities who are socially isolated or at risk of social isolation. 
Based on survey results, an, ind an individual is referred for an assistive technology consultation and services are provided by the Connecticut Tech Act program and assistive technology partners. These no wrong door systems, and this is just one example of many, the innovations have been amazing that the states have engaged in, along with the um, area agencies on aging, centers for independent living, and all the local partners. People have really um, shown their ingen ingenuity and their innovation, and they're helping people at risk of social isolation get connected to social engagement programs and technologies. And that's not all that's happening. In June, the Administration for Community Living, along with the White House Office of Science, Technology, and Policy, the United States Department of Health and Human Services, the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, the United States Department of Veterans Affairs, and the, the Federal Communications Commission and the Consumer Technology Association Foundation announced the mobilizing and empowering the nation to address loneliness and social isolation, also known as Mental Health Innovation Challenge. The Mental Health Innovation Challenge strategy is to develop a clearinghouse of social engagement programs and technologies that help people get connected and or engage to reduce and or eliminate their risk of social isolation. The vision is that the clearinghouse would have a built-in screening tool to identify a person's risk of social isolation, obtain their needs, interests, and preferences, match them to available social engagement programs and technologies, and generate a list of options. We heard earlier from speakers the importance of tailored interventions, those that really resonate with the people that they're designed to serve, and enable them to directly enroll in these programs or acquire the technology. The Clearinghouse would include training videos and user reviews. We've received 38 applications um, for this challenge, and we'll be announcing up to three teams that will move into phase two very shortly, the beginning of October. The top two teams will present their solutions, and the winner will be announced at the Consumer Electronics Show, also known as CES 2021, in January. This is very exciting. Um, in addition to this work, we've been working with organizations addressing social isolation, like the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, N4A. Advancing States, AT3, the State Assistive Technology Act Programs Technical Assistance Resource Center, the Consumer Technology Association Foundation, the National Council on Aging, the AARP Foundation, the Colorado Center for Inclusive Design and Engineering, the Meals on Wheels America, Leading Age Center for Aging Services Technology, the Georgia Tech Pass It On Center, and the Older Adults Technology Services. Together with these organizations, we've developed the Mental Health Innovation Challenge concept, hosted several webinars and events offer, often reaching thousands of people to increase awareness of social isolation and the technology and programs available to engage and connect people. We are also working together to develop a national strategy to join with these organizations, our federal partners, and many more organizations, community leaders, and faith-based organizations, and people like you, to connect and engage 10 million people that are socially isolated. That's a big goal, but we're up to the challenge. While we're developing the strategy, we'll be working together to increase awareness of social isolation and the programs and technology already available to connect and engage people. That's what we've discovered together, that there are solutions out there. We just need to help people get connected to them. We invite you to join us in spreading the word and helping our neighbors learn about and use these programs and technologies. Here with us today to teach us more about social engagement technologies are two of our partners, Alex Glazebrook and Carolyn Phillips. Alex is the Director of Operations, Older Adult Technology Services, also known as OATS. Alex supervises the organization's national program footprint, manages impact monitoring, and assesses new technologies for inclusion in OATS programming. He has served as a project partner committee for the Engage National Resource Center since Engage began in 2017. Welcome, Alex. And in addition, Carolyn Phillips is the nationally recognized is nationally recognized in the field of assistive technology and disabilities. Carolyn serves as director of services and education at the Center for Inclusive Design and Innovation at Georgia Tech. She is also director and principal investigator of Tools for Life, 
Georgia's Assistive Technology Act Program, and the National Pass It On Center. Carolyn and Alex, can you tell us more about your work and how it relates to technology and social engagement? And Alex, would you like to go first? Sure. Thanks, Lori. Uh, yeah, so really happy to be here today with everyone. And um, OATS, Older Adults Technology Services, a lot of people on the call uh, may also know uh, us as Senior Planet, which is uh, how seniors see us. And we are a 16-year-old nonprofit uh, that has been doing programming with a technology emphasis for the last 16 years. Uh, it started in New York, and now we actually have a national footprint uh, in six states. And, you know, when we talk about our work, we really talk about how our uh, programs are linking technology to outcome. So when people come to us, we're really trying to understand what's the motivation and what's the drive behind the reasons that, you know, they may have come to a Senior Planet program. Uh, so our programs are not actually structured around technology. That may seem odd. They're actually structured around uh, impact. And when we talk about impact, we talk about five different areas, uh, things like health, civic engagement, financial security, creativity, and also social engagement. So what we really try and do through our programs is uh, create community. Um, and we do that historically before COVID, we were doing all of that in person. So uh, another sort of misconception of our work is that we were doing a lot of work online prior to COVID, but we weren't. Uh, we have a pretty robust website, but other than that, uh, our programs were actually all done in person in small groups uh, of 8 to 14 people. Um, and as COVID sort of has changed everything for everyone on this call, and the last session had a lot of information about what the implications are uh, of those changes, we've really tried to maintain um, what we really see uh, sort of the backbone of our work being, which is the building of community. So we're trying to do that online now. It's tricky, right? Because uh, a lot of the ways that we were fostering community is by face-to-face -face interaction. So since March, we've taken uh, almost our entire program catalog online. Many of our programs that we've uh, brought online have a social engagement emphasis. So we have health and wellness programming, but they're really about bringing a group together, exercising, and then talking about your day, or programs that help link resources to different areas of social connectedness. So whether it's you know figuring out how to um, interact with family and friends on video chat or staying connected on WhatsApp, we try and weave in a technology element virtually and kind of maintain that feeling of community, uh, even though we can't be together in person. Um, so since we've gone online, we've had about 65,000 people participate in our programs. So it's been a busy, busy time for us. Um, so just in a little over seven months, we've had a really huge volume of people participate. Um, and I think the way that we've sort of continued to produce that feeling of engagement and community is by really lowering the barriers to accessing our program. Um, so everything we're doing is free. It's always been free. But now there's sort of that added element of, you know, well, what if I can't get online? You know, what if I don't have connectivity in my home? What if I don't have a device? So we've taken steps, and I think those are some of the questions later, which I'll talk about in more detail, to try and help people stay engaged and feel like they're still part of that community, even if they have low levels of digital literacy, low levels of technology readiness. Um, we're doing everything we can to help support people and keep them engaged. Uh, and, you know, we're really, in some ways, we're excited about what uh, the pandemic has forced us to change. It's been an, obviously a monumental and really difficult period of time for everyone, but it's also provided ways for us to get our programming out further. So when we used to be restricted to these, you know, in-person environments, we're not anymore. So we have people joining us from all over the country that never would have been able to interact with OATS or a Senior Planet programming. Uh, in the past, and it's actually building a larger community. So we're serving more people, um, we're ha we have more diversity, more experience, and I think that that really helps uh, produce and maintain a level of social engagement that people feel excited about. Um, so we've been trying to lean into it and um, you know take whatever positives we can uh, with all the changes that have been coming.
I think you're uh, muted, Lori. Thank you. That's really amazing. Um, thank you, Alex. And the way that um, the the situation has really expanded opportunity and and the um, community um, is very interesting. Sixty five thousand people um, in seven months. Wow, that's program growth for sure. Um, so, Carolyn, how about you? Um, can you uh, go ahead and, and respond to tell us a little bit about Georgia Tech and the work that you're all doing? Absolutely. And I'm thrilled to be here with you, all of you. Uh, I believe time's the most valuable thing we've got. And so thank you all for being a part of this. And uh, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, yay for Engage in this summit and the participation. Uh, also, um, I've, and I've told Lori this, uh, you know, uh, offline and personally, um, how much I appreciate what ACL has done with the mental challenge and also just bringing together so many f uh, amazing um, connections. I think we've been able to leverage uh, kind of what's working and figure out and try some things. Um, it's kind of like having a big sandbox in some ways, which is a beautiful thing. Uh, I've told um, Alec that I've actually used a lot of y'all's resources, which is outstanding. And so, so appreciative. Yeah. Um, and such great information that was shared earlier. So I am at Georgia Tech and uh, at Georgia Tech, uh, a lot of what we do is we live in that space of um, research and then how does research inform uh, practice and policy and then how does that end up re again informing research. And so I, I thankfully um, get to work on a lot of awesome pr projects. Uh, we have the Tech Sage uh, Rehabilitation Engineering Research Center um, where we have been focused, this is uh, for you know uh, many years actually, on social isolation and what does that really look like um, and working with uh, Dr. Wendy Rogers and John Sanford and, and a lot of folks in that space of what does telepresence look like and, and how does that really, uh, you know, affect folks um it would there be would there be adoption and sure enough we found that yes there is adoption and just like you were hearing earlier from our previous speakers uh it, it does make a huge difference it's transformational actually uh in the lives of individuals when they can connect um being able to see each other uh we have found actually is even more important than just hearing a voice, right? So uh, thinking of all of that. With our work with the Pass It On Center, um, we you know, have been trying for, uh, you know, I've been in that space of getting uh, a, you know, assistive technology, technology uh, to individuals with disabilities, individuals that are aging, uh, pretty much my whole career for 26 years. And it is so exciting to finally have a spotlight where people are like, hey, you know, we should get technology to people what do you think? And I'm like, yes, we should do this. And so, um, so this is an amazing moment when it comes to uh, just this national spotlight and a lot of interest and a lot of, um, I think, uh, awareness now of where we do have, uh, you know, huge gaps in our infrastructure um, where Wi-Fi uh, totally breaks down and it's it's not there, um, where landlines have ended and there are still people that we still don't have connected. Um, and then even increasing uh, awareness as to how can we fill those gaps. And I, I'm a huge believer that we are stronger together. Um, I appreciated the slide that y'all saw earlier uh, about that we may not be in all in the same boat, but we are definitely in the same storm and figuring out how we can collectively move together uh, and 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 I help everybody live their best life, if you will. Um, so with our work uh, with the Pass It On Center, um, we are and have been for many years uh, connecting people with uh, iPads, with uh, computers, um, even sometimes with smaller technologies. Uh, it's a national network that is through the Assistive Technology Act programs, associated with the Assistive Technology Act programs. Uh, we have a lot of independent living centers that are engaged in this activity. And then also um, a lot of area agencies on aging and aging disability resource centers who are involved and in, in really working on how we can get that you know, technology just a little further down the road, if you will. Uh, so if you do not know your assistive technology um, uh, resource uh, center, you can get in, uh, you can get in touch with um, the Pass It On Center. You can also get connected through the AT3 Center. 
Um, with our program, uh, we have that great ability, and it's it's really awesome uh, to also be working on the wireless RERC, um, Rehabilitation Engineering Research Center, where we're able to uh, see um, firsthand what are the issues when it comes to connection, especially during emergencies. Uh, where, where are the gaps, and then how do we fill those gaps? So being on that, and I often say we're dancing on that cutting edge of um, knowing, uh, you know, here are some issues, and then how can we do some proof of concept, and then what can we replicate within the community? I was taking notes like crazy as y'all were talking because there's some good ideas that I want to connect with you about and figuring out how we can, uh, you know, maximize that and see what really works. But I am so thankful too to be working with Tools for Life um, and serving as the director of Tools for Life in Georgia. It's our Assistive Technology Act program, just like all of you have an Assistive Technology Act program in your states and territories. And the great thing is, is that we get to work with uh, our director, Abby Cox, um, of the Division of Aging Services here in Georgia. And we are actively um, working together to have assistive technology labs uh, within our network. Um, having reused assistive technology, gently used assistive technology um, at the ready, uh, teaching uh, frontline staff um, and folks who are on the phone about apps, low cost, no cost apps that can increase participation, increase um, connectedness and as we socially distance. Uh, and then, you know, paying attention also to those, you know, those gaps. Um, it's interesting too how the conversation is shifting. Uh, you know, for years we had talked with the VA about, gosh, wouldn't it be great if we could just give out assistive technology and give out, you know, uh, iPads. Sure enough, um, they just announced an initiative where they're going to give out iPads, um, which is outstanding. I see uh, you're shaking your head, Alec. I'm thrilled uh, because because this is a big win. And I think it's because we finally have the spotlight of connection matters and uh, having the technology matters um, and being connected. Uh, there are a lot of resources uh, when it comes to getting people more connected and we're trying different things. Um, one of the questions that was raised earlier uh, is about how do we help people, how do we find people who are socially isolated? Um, we're not having a trouble finding people who are socially isolated in Georgia um, for better or for worse. Uh, you know, we're, we're getting creative and we're actually finding folks. We are getting them connected with technology. We're helping them find low cost, even free solutions, working with our Department of Education so that the buses that are out there with hotspots that are driving around and parking um, within communities uh, that our seniors can actually get connected to. Uh, and then really helping people, you know, get that one touch intuitive universal design approach, figuring out what's built in and how they can indeed uh, be able to connect. Um, it's making a huge difference. And it's just a very exciting moment uh, to be able to witness, but especially to be able to act. And so um, I'm honored to be with you and I'll turn it back to you, Lori. Well, thank you so much, Carolyn. And, and this is really exciting and we're getting some questions in through the chat too. So thank you all. Keep those questions coming. Um, one of the questions is really around, um, could you talk, and Alex, you, uh, you alluded to this a little bit, but could you discuss how some devices, even like everyday devices, like no tech devices or cell phones, TVs, computers, really have some accessibility features and could be used um, to help combat social isolation? Sure. I mean, mainstream technologies these days, a lot of them have built in accessibility features that people just don't know about. So if you are using a mainstream technology like an iPad um, or an Android based tablet, the accessibility features there are robust and really great, especially on Apple iOS devices. Um, you know, I see one of the, the questions here in the comments is, you know, what about people that don't have any tech? And, and one of the ways that we've been trying to um, at least provide some opportunity for engagement is, is that all of our programming has uh, call-in lines, you know, just like when you join a Zoom meeting and you can dial in or you can go on video. So we've really been uh, doing a lot to publicize the fact that, hey, you can participate, just call on your landline phone and you can still get the information, you can still hear people, you can still contribute. Um, and we're having about 25 to 28% of the people who participate in our programs are actually joining um, just through a landline phone. So it's been a huge uh, opportunity for those people that, that don't have connectivity, maybe don't have a device, or, or aren't at the point where they can join you know, a program because of maybe accessibility reasons or um, just general know-how. 
That that's terrific. And Carolyn, how about um, ideas that you might have on on how Georgia Tech is helping people with um, low tech or no tech options? Yes. And so. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, honestly, uh, I just like Alex was saying, it, it's um, very exciting because it used to be we it would take us you know a bit of time to get people connected with um, technology. If they didn't have technology, uh, it could take weeks or months. And now it's hours um, because uh, we have been able to get smarter um, and partner uh, with a lot of different organizations and agencies. Um, and I encourage you to you know go online and look. Book, um, you can go to the Pass It On Center. You could also go to uh, like everyone um, connected. Uh, you could go to any number of other resources. Um, and you can even type in refurbished uh, assistive technology or refurbished uh, iPad. And, it, and it's instantly you'll be connected with resources there. Um, and it is easy uh, to be able to get those resources. Um, there's, uh, you know, Amazon, for example. Um, I was buying something not long ago and uh, they said, hey, um, we saw that you bought this one item. Would you like to buy 50 of these, you know, eye touches for a dollar each? And I'm like, yes, <laughs> bought them. I had no reason to have them aside from just getting them out. We've got them all out, which is great. Uh, you know, we're able to get uh, technology, you know, loaded on. Uh, and I think also just being smart about what's built in. I think a lot of times people don't know the power of what's in their pocket or in their pocketbook um, and or in their hand. A lot of people don't know um, that, uh, you know, just with one or two clicks, you can do, uh, you know, FaceTime. You can uh, get these, you know, free uh, connections, um, you know, WhatsApp, you, you know, that was brought up a little bit ago. And what a great resource for international connection uh, and being able to uh, connect in real time. And it's a free solution um, for the most part. And so just thinking about uh, what does that all look like and how do we make it all happen um, as quickly as possible. So there's a bunch of accessibility features. Um, uh, you know, uh, I was working with somebody the other day. Uh, they were having a tough time. Uh, they had some vision-related disabilities. Um, literally uh, was able to take the iPhone that they had and that they had been squinting at, showed them how to zoom in and make it bigger, um, which is actually built in if you go into the settings and then into accessibility. Uh, there's all kinds of things. Uh, we also turned it on so that it was uh, could be read out loud, everything could be read out loud to the individual, and then was even to, able to show how you can speak um, and, and have all the text show up through speech recognition. All of that's built in, everybody has it, you know? Uh, and then um, we actually, I had a cable, because I'm one of those people who carries all kinds of cables around with me, and we were able to connect the iPhone actually to the TV and everything was bigger. And so, you know, they, they were like, oh my gosh, you solved all my problems just with this one cable and click, click, click. And I was like, boom, it's that easy, free solutions. Oh, well, well, thank you both. And this is really exciting. And I have to tell you, like, personally, I can really relate to this because our church does their services on YouTube, right? And so my yeah. folks, they have a phone, so they, and they're in their 80s and they're looking at their phone, right? And I'm like, hey, do you know you can use the app on your television to see the church service? So now they can see it and they're like, wow, this is so much easier. Um, so there are all these features that are built into things. So if I um, am in a local organization and I want to help people, but I don't even know how to find these things, who can help us? Do you want to answer that or do you want me to, Alex, either way? I mean, that's a good question. I mean, I would say there's a lot of resources out there. I mean, not to be a shameless promoter, but SeniorPlanet.org has a lot of resources. Um, you know, we have accessibility resources. We have connectivity guides about how you can get low-cost internet in your home. Uh, options for finding uh, devices, you know, refurbished or at subsidy. Um, and there's a lot of groups out there who are starting, I think, to kind of converge on this space because it's, you know, there's an opportunity now. Um, but I think, you know, something that Lori said when we kicked off here, or um, maybe it was in the last session, was that it's really about everyone coming together. And I think being virtual has, you know, provided opportunity for, um, collaboration that wasn't once there, it's like knocked down a lot of walls. So what some groups may not have, you know, Senior Planet and Oats, we don't actually do device distribution, but we could direct them to someone who does. And I think that that 
uh, has a really kind of powerful effect on the work we're doing right now. Yeah. I would just add, um, and it's so uh, well stated, just to tout actually seeing your planet it right on. Uh, we, as I said, I use it all the time. Um, pretty much, uh, it's one of my favorites. And then also, uh, I think having assistive technology labs within your centers, um, having that connection and being able to see uh, and interact and try things out. Um, uh, that's something that uh, your Assistive Technology Act program can help you with. Um, it's something you can go to any number of uh, organizations. And uh, there are lots of folks that have assistive technology. You can start out small. Um, we have an app finder um, where you can go and see the vet vetted apps. It's the Tools for Life app finder. Um, we have a whole section now on COVID-19 um, apps that are out there that have been vetted. It's not the million best apps. It's like, here's five apps um, that we know that work. So just thinking about how can you how can you actually try some of this? Um, and that's what we encourage people to do is just try. Uh, it's interesting, uh, several friends of mine uh, ended up in the New York Times article that was um, on August 24th. And what they were saying, these are folks who had been isolated and they said um, when the world shut down, actually their world opened up and they became more connected. And it is because of these technology solutions and often they're free and often they're low cost. Wow. Well, yeah, well thanks other... so much. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead Lord. I, I was it's just going to no say way. the other thing I would add just to piggyback on what Carolyn was saying is that, you know, I think a lot of people, there's sort of that initial barrier or set of barriers that, you know, preclude people from even trying. And what we've been trying to do is, you know, we've set up uh, local and national hotlines where we'll actually pair uh, and work one on one with people who call in just to get to that next step. Maybe it's we'll get you on a Zoom call so you can at least Zoom with your family or maybe it's we'll direct you to a low cost device or Internet option. So we're spending a lot of time one on one really intensively with people. And I think that's helping bridge that gap that gets people past some of not sort of the, the classic accessibility issues or, you know, that we talk about, but more of the, the barriers and, and the fear that's associated with technology as people age sometimes. So we're spending a lot of time kind of in that zone um, with intensive one-on-one -on -one support just to get people one step along the way. And that's really been a huge um, successful part of the work we've been doing virtually. That that's that's terrific. So it, it sounds like, and that's one of the questions we have in the chat. Like, how do we help people that are sort of um, unfamiliar with technology take that first step? Um, and it's sounding like um, that one-on-one -on -one hotline is a strategy to to go ahead and do that. Um, I'm wondering too if there might be other strategies or things that might be happening. Um, within communities, like are there um, opportunities for peers to teach peers or younger people to teach older people? My uh, my nephew does some strategies with my with my mom, um, and she's becoming a Facebook expert. So, uh, like, do you have strategies like that? Um, and are there things that we could be replicating in other communities that are working? Yes, I you know I think it's. Um, figuring out what is the motivator and then how can we actually uh, leverage that to um, uh, build it and, and get folks uh, even more connected. Uh, there's a group of uh, folks that I was working with um, and they didn't really want to tell me what it was, why they wanted to get so connected. I, originally, I think they tried to pitch it that it was a Bible study, but it was a poker group and <laughs> they actually were like, okay, so you know, how can we all get connected? And I'm like, I don't, it's your victory. I don't care how, what you're doing. I just want to help you. And so I think that, you know, really and truly it's figuring out what is the hook um, that, that helps. A, a lot of youth groups, um, a lot of, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, I was working with a synagogue and uh, they have a group of uh, young folks that um, part of what they're doing is they are playing like uh, chess and uh, words with friends and things like that um, with older adults. And that's what they're doing, um, which is great. Uh, there's other uh, 
you know, groups where we're just getting connected, uh, you know, getting people connected um, around gaming. It's amazing uh, the dopamine that's released in your brain and what it game it is. It's a changer um, as far as making people feel connected, um, not putting a lot of pressure, you know, on. Uh, and so I think it's just figuring out whether it's a sewing, um, you know, there's a quilting bee uh, that I helped get set up um, virtually. I don't quilt, so I didn't get them set up. <laughs> I just helped them figure out how to stay connected. Um, or even just having tea together, uh, you know, uh, all of those things. And so uh, just figuring out, you know, what is the motivator and, and then leveraging that. I, I would totally agree with that comment. I mean, it, for us, it's relevance. You know, relevance is a huge motivator for people. So how do you tie that to what people are most interested in, whether it's, you know, poker or Bible study group? I think that's really, really important. Um, you know, and some of the things we've done, Lori, you know, we at the local level in New York City, which is, you know, a big city, you know, they, they actually distributed 10,000 internet connected tablets to people who were socially isolated, uh, living alone in New York's public housing. So that's a big project, but it's hyper local. And we're kind of using that as a model because we were brought in to help support people with training, our hotline, and just kind of continued uh, outreach to make sure that they're making the most of their new device that they got from free uh, for free from the city, which also came with 12 months of connectivity, which is really nice. So we're using that as a model, or trying to at the local level. And then we've also partnered uh, actually with the Humana Foundation on a really exciting uh, two-year project called Aging Connected, where we're working to get a million people connected uh, to the internet in different ways. So that's a really, um, that's a national program where we're working with telecom providers, uh, community-based organizations, and other groups to help kind of create this, almost like a blanket over the US. So if you're not connected, we'll help you. Um, so I think it's kind of leveraging local and national um, to kind of make sure we're touching everywhere, which, you know, is a big task. There's, we were just doing some research and there's about 22 million people uh, older adults who are not online in the U.S. So it's a huge, staggering number. Wow. Wow. That's that's um, that's really um, a challenge we've got to overcome, but together we will. Um, when when you think about the, the work you all have been doing, demonstrating outcomes becomes really um, an impact becomes so critical, you know, as um, people make decisions about where to invest funds, what to pay for and things, it's really a key component. So could you talk a little bit too about how uh, we can demonstrate efficacy of programs and measure impact in virtual settings? Like how does it differ or how is it similar to in-person person settings? And then specifically, what advice would you give to area agencies on aging or local service providers who are incorporating technology and want to measure its effectiveness as they deliver programs virtually? So who so wants we, to go first? Yeah, I'm happy yeah, to jump on the uh, We have uh, something to add to, um, you know, being at Georgia Tech um, and, and being in that space uh, here, everything is about outcomes and it is about measuring and it's okay to fail. Like we've tried things that failed and it's okay. Um, and so, because what that does is it actually helps the rest of us understand. That's why the network that uh, Lori uh, and ACL have, you know, those conversations we're having are so vital. Um, but the way that we're measuring that, um, uh, especially when it comes to social isolation and when it comes to, uh, you know, making sure um, that people want to continue to invest in technology um, because it's all connected, right? Uh, donors will donate. Um, or you can raise more funds or you can prove the case, um, but you have to have that data and you have to have those measures. So there are, uh, there's a wide range of, um, uh, you know, scales that we've used, whether it's national core indicators, whether it's um, uh, making sure that, uh, you know, something as simple as customer service. There are also happiness um, models that we've used. Uh, and then there's, you know, qualitative, quantitative, looking at uh, how much is the person connected? They said they weren't connected, now they are connected. Has that changed anything? Um, do they have a routine that they didn't have before? Um, are they taking showers now? Are they, you know, there's all kinds of ways that we can measure. And uh, so I definitely am happy to explore that with anybody. 
Um, we've done all kinds of that. We continue to do all kinds of uh, measurements. Uh, and then also being able to, once again, take that data and, and being able to uh, shape your story around that so that you can get more funding. I, I got to tell you, every day investing in technology, investing in people, investing in connection is the way to go. And so um, being able to show that tangible uh, information, uh, it, it's, you know, not a lot of people like to collect it, but I got to tell you, um, I, I, it's so important uh, and so vital. So, and Alex? Yeah, totally agree with you. You know, we, we have a pretty robust impact monitoring at Oats, but since we went virtual, it changed a lot. So, you know, all of the impact areas that our organization has uh, that I talked about earlier, you know, we have uh, assessments to measure each of those areas. So how are people improving in, in their uh, levels of health or social engagement? But now that we went online, uh, all of those assessments that were done in uh, person were now online. So we still tried to maintain a lot of the validated tools and instruments we were using for so for social engagement specifically um and we call it social engagement instead of you know getting into the social isolation and loneliness although we measure both domains uh we're still looking at things that uh are validated in the in the literature so we we use the campaign to end loneliness to uh, measure people's levels of connectedness we use uh, the ucla uh, loneliness scale which is the short form form and we also use something called the CDC Healthy Days Survey. And we've been distributing them uh, virtually uh, using Qualtrics, which is a survey platform, and trying to actually help people complete them while they're still with us on our virtual programs. Because a lot of, I think what happens is if you drop a link in the chat or you send an email later, people don't tend to follow up. So we'll actually do spend some time at the end of our programs actually going through the survey question by question as a group and letting people answer on their own, but with us so they know how to do it. And that's uh, enabled us to still collect a, a lot of good, probably not quite as deep data because we're not asking quite as many questions, but we're still capturing those things that Carolyn uh, was talking about before that are really important for funders. You know, what is the actual impact you're having less, you know, less about, uh, did you have a good time today? Did you enjoy the program? We really want to know about the impact and the deep uh, meaning that it has for people. Well, th thanks so much. We're, we've got about, um, let's see here, about 10 minutes left. And um, I wanted to maybe ask you this question. So using your crystal ball, what do you foresee as future directions in the use of technology to address social isolation and loneliness? And what tips would you share with staff at area agencies on aging or local service providers as they look at incorporating technology into their programming? It's a good question. I mean, I, for, 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 yeah, for me, I, I would say that it, it's here to stay. You know, a lot of people have been coming to us asking, uh, you know, are um, your virtual programs going to continue or persist once we go back to, you know, normal. And I think it, uh, COVID has changed everything. And I think service provision, uh, it will always be different now. And it's, you know, some, some ways that's good because it's, it's providing more opportunity to get the word out and to get the programs out, uh, you know, when physical constraints aren't an issue anymore. And I think at the local level, it's really important to try and take small steps. I think a lot of um, times, it feels like when you need to implement a new technology, you know, intervention, or you're trying to do a new technology-based program, that it's all or nothing. And I don't, I don't think it has to be that way. I think you can take small steps to get there. So whether it's, you know, incorporating a Zoom session once a week, or it's, you know, piping in some new technology here and there, and kind of migrating your people um, that you work with, your clients, or whoever, um, you know, progressively, I think is really important. But I think a lot of people take that kind of quick and fast approach. And it takes time, um, especially if you're working with people who are really not familiar with technology and may have a lot of barriers uh, and, you know, barriers in the classical sense and barriers in the I don't have a device sense. So, um, but I, I do think that COVID overall has just kind of changed and, and we need to kind of plan to be using virtual uh, program delivery models as, uh, you know, a perpetual part of everything we do now. I would just, I think that's excellent. And I think we're looking at a very similar, maybe the same crystal ball, um, because, uh, you know, what I think uh, is that it absolutely is here to stay. 
um, which is excellent um, when it comes to true access. Um, there are so many people that were isolated before this. And that's, you know, that, that headline, when the world shut down, finally it opened up, right? For some of the folks that had been isolated for years. And so that's a very exciting moment. Um, and when I'm thinking about program, and I've had this question asked before, um, and we've wor we're working with a lot of our, uh, you know, AAAs and independent living centers and our uh, partner organizations, um, within the Tools for Life program, I, seriously, for 15 years, we have been doing, if we host a, an advisory council meeting, we always have a virtual way, usually video, for somebody to participate. Um, if we're doing a training, we always are offering that. Uh, we have cameras built in uh, to our training rooms. Um, uh, this is actually, we've been kind of ready for this moment. And I would encourage you, uh, just like Alex is saying, take it small, but really take it, embrace it. Um, we have trainings that, you know, in the past, maybe 50 people would have participated in. Now we're seeing hundreds of people participating. They are showing, they're showing up. Um, and, and I think that that's very important. I think also people understanding the uh, importance of accessibility, how to turn on that, uh, you know, captioning. We're seeing huge advances in uh, AI, artificial intelligence, and with captioning. We're seeing huge advances uh, when it also comes to picture quality. Um, and also, uh, believe it or not, universal design and making things more age friendly um, and universal for everybody. And we're finding that that has wins across the lifespan, um, whether it's just making one click access or uh, easy and, in, in, you know, real time to technical assistance. So um, there are some real positives. I know COVID-19 is tragic. Obviously, we're collectively navigating this together. Um, but I will say there are some real wins uh, when it comes to uh, it, huge advances that I don't think would have happened otherwise when it comes to access, acquisition, accessibility, and, and really breaking down some of the barriers of isolation. Uh, it's an exciting moment uh, when you look at some of that through, through those lens. So, and uh, happy to go on about this, obviously, <laughs> but I, I think Alex, you said it very well. Well, I have to tell you both that this has really been an exciting conversation. There is so much more to talk about. And what's been really exciting is that you've all shared possibilities, that there's huge opportunities for us to be working together, 65,000 people in seven months. I mean, that's amazing. Programs where you had 50 people, now you have 100, you know, um, it's really amazing. And what we have to figure out is, and I think Alex, you were talking about earlier too, that there's still a lot more people that aren't connected. And there's still a large volume of people who don't have broadband access. Um, so we've got to figure out how do we really work together to begin to um, do whatever we can to lessen um, some of that impact. And you've shared lots of strategies with us today. We're hoping too that um, people can contact you. I think the, your contact information will be shared with those attending the summit today. Um, and um, and if they have questions, you can help get them connected to others um, if you're not able to connect them directly um, or answer their questions. So uh, Carolyn, Alex, thank you so much uh, for your presentations today, the exciting information that you've shared with us and the solutions. Um, the thank you the audience for these questions that you've been sending in and we didn't get to all of them we tried to cover as many as we could um, and maybe there's a way we can answer those questions we weren't able to get to um, in a response back to you um, but we really want to encourage you um, to work with us and to help us spread the word about the risk of social isolation and loneliness um, and strategies that we can be using to connect people to social engagement programs and technology. Because together, we can connect our families, our neighbors, and our friends, and reduce social isolation, and take this situation we're currently confronting and really turn it into a huge opportunity. So um, thanks for to everyone today. I'd like to turn things back to Sandy Markwood. And Sandy, thank you so much for the opportunity to share this information with the nation. We're thrilled to be able to do that. Sandy, we'll turn things back to you. Thanks so much. <clears throat> what a fantastic panel. Thank you, Alex and Carolyn. What great information. 
I have had the opportunity to visit both a senior planet and Georgia Tech Center, and they are both amazing. And Lori, thanks to you and the leadership and support of ACL on social isolation. Um, it's, it's made such a difference. We know as we tackle social isolation that we need to look to a range of technology options. High tech and low tech options are so important as we look for ways to continue to innovate while supporting the social engagement needs of older adults and caregivers. Your insights on technology access, training and acquiring technology help us to think through the different facets that are so critical for moving forward in this space. As we continue to move forward, the Engaged Resource Center is here to support you and your social engagement work during the pandemic and beyond. Engaged recently released a best practices publication and the video we shared earlier in the summit, both of which highlight a number of innovative aging network social engagement programs and how the programs have been adapted in response to COVID-19. These resources complement our COVID-19 response, which has included a COVID-19 resource page that includes innovative programs, COVID-19 specific webinars, a consumer focused flyer that you can co-brand with your organization, as well as a series of consumer focused blog posts you can share with older adults in your community around the opportunities for social engagement. Links to these resources are available in the chat box and will be shared by email with all attendees after today's summit. We also recently began our work on another three-year work plan for our work on social isolation funded by ACL. To expand and enhance the work of, in, of engaged, our efforts to support the aging network, to develop and implement strategies to socially engage older adults will continue until this new project, under this new project, we will be working in collaboration with an expanded project advisory committee. As part of our new project, we will have new resources and tools available for your use in the coming months. So please continue to engage with us via our website, newsletter, and social media, as you can access these new resources and we can all continue to learn together. I think that we heard throughout the summit is that promoting social engagement and combating social isolation is going to take all of us working together. We also wanted to highlight a recently launched web page from ACL with lots of resources for staying engaged and avoiding social isolation. We will be sending a survey evaluation link to you soon. We'll also want to know how we did and look forward to your feedback on resources and information that you and your agency need to help shape the future on these social isolation events. Keep an eye out for it. Before we close, I wanted to recognize the staff of the Engaged Resource Center who helped put this summit together, Meredith Hanley, Roberta, Le Rebecca Levine, and Brenda Luna Macito for their support in putting the summit together, as well as Sherry Clark, our ACL project officer. I also wanted to recognize again, our partners, Generations United, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, and Older Adults Technology Services, OATS. And I wanna thank all of our wonderful speakers for sharing their time, their wisdom, their experience with us today. And most importantly, I want to give a sincere thanks to all of you for joining us today. I wish you all a good rest of your day and I hope that you will continue co to connect to the Engaged Resource Center. Thank you so much.